This morning I'm going to finish up <laughs> with James. I've tried to do this before and things have changed with the service. So we'll just, uh, this is actually the, the last uh, verses in James 5, starting in chap, um, verse 17. I think it's very appropriate for so many things that we face in our lives, so many situations, including situations that we see happening in the world today, but also situations we face as individuals, as families, as uh, married couples, as parents, people in, in the church. We need to realize the depth of how God has put us together for a reason, and that is to be a healing community and to bring healing and wholeness to the world around us. So again in James chapter 5, starting in verse 17. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick. And the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. And he prayed fervently that it might not rain. And for three years and six months, it did not rain on the earth. And then he prayed again, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth bore its fruits. My brother, if anyone among you wanders from the truth, and someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. Now James began his letter to the Christians in the first century who were scattered in different communities. This isn't a letter that was written to just one group, but a letter that was written to the Christian community. And he began his letters, letter being honest to the fact that we would face trials and tribulations and temptations in this world because it is a fallen world. And he wrote, Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kind. And he knew that tribulation and trials and conflicts would bring character perseverance and patience in people's lives. You know, God can use the negative stuff around us to bring forth good things. Because God is good and he is above the circumstances that we face. And he's able to supply us with hope and joy and faith and love. Now, as James closes his letter, he makes some very simple statements that are very profound, like, is anyone among you suffering? James knows that there is suffering in this life. He's already talked about temptation and trials and tribulation. He knows that there are hardships that we face. And our response to those things should be prayer not complaining or, or feeling overwhelmed 
or feeling discouraged or giving up. But suffering should actually drive us closer to God. And how we respond to suffering determines whether we can experience God's presence in the midst of hardship. You know, even in the world around us, as we have seen with tragic events, the evil things that happen, like acts of terror that we've seen in Paris, can draw people together. They can open people's hearts to look to God for answers. They can question their lives and the way they've been living and realize there are more important things for them in life. The key to how they respond to suffering is prayer. If anyone is suffering, let him pray. You know, God doesn't bring the acts of terror. He, they are the results of sin and hatred and the powers of darkness and Satan. But God uses them to wake people up, to help them to sense the urgency of drawing close to God and asking God for help. As James wrote in his letter dealing with conflicts within the church community and suffering that that brings and disagreements and relationships, his answer was submit to God, turn to God, draw close to God. He will draw close to you and resist the devil. Humble yourself before the Lord and God in his time will lift you up. But you know, James isn't, his letter isn't just a gloomy letter about trials and tribulations and hardship. He also talks about joy and happiness. There should be joy and happiness. And he says, let those who are happy sing praise. A part of our church community is learning to sing praise, express our joy, not just through praying, but also singing hymns and songs and spiritual songs, making a joyful noise to the Lord. We are a community that needs to pray because of the suffering in our own lives and the world around us, but also a community that needs to sing and rejoice, as Paul says, rejoice in all things. So we gather and we pray together, we sing together, we pray for the sick, we confess our faults to each other, we seek healing and restoration in the world around us. You see, James is very much a realist. He understands the battles that we face, the battles within ourselves, with addictions and habits and hang-ups, the battles within the community and relationships with each other and how people respond to each other, the battles that are in the world around us. And because of all those things, because sin is still very much a thing that people struggle with, even people of faith, he also writes about sickness, admitting that there is sickness in the church, that Christians do get sick. His advice is not just to be complacent about the sickness, but to pray about it. And he asks something very specific. If any one of you is sick, call together the elders the church leaders, to pray over you. Don't stay in the place of isolation trying to deal with the issue yourself. Now, I believe that this, this is much more than physical sickness that he's talking about. It can be emotional, mental, spiritual, social, and relationships. People need to pray for each other, but they also need to have the 
those who are gifted and those who are in leadership, the elders of the church, as he says, come together and pray over the sick. The prayer of faith, the prayer in the name of Jesus, through the power of his name, the prayer acknowledging the Holy Spirit through the anointing of the oil will save the sick and the Lord will raise him up. You see, when you ask others to pray for you and pray over you, that is an act of faith. That is a way of showing God that you're serious about what you believe. You're being vulnerable and allowing someone else to join their faith with yours, to seek answers and healing and recovery. And this is a part of what Jesus taught and preached. We read at the end of the Gospel of Mark how Jesus told his disciples these things. It says, go into the world and preach the gospel to all of creation. And then a little later he says, these signs will accompany those who believe. In my name, in Jesus' name, they will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. As Jesus did this, he spoke to those who were sick and they were healed. He touched them and they touched him. He laid hands on them and they were recovered. He forgave their sins and they were healed. He spoke words and they were delivered from demons. As it says in Luke 5:17 concerning Jesus, the power of the Lord was present with him to heal the sick. The power of the Lord was present. It is present with us in the body of Christ, through the Holy Spirit, through Jesus Christ who is in us. And he told his disciples in Luke 9, 1, he says, when Jesus called together the 12, he gave them power and authority to drive out all demons and to cure diseases. He sent them out to preach the gospel of the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. It's not just preach the gospel. It's not just teach and preach. It's also heal the sick. That is a part of the commission that Jesus gave his disciples. He gave them power and authority. In Matthew 28, it says that all that he was, Jesus had all power and authority in heaven and earth, and he, he gave it to his disciples, and he says, Go therefore in my name. And he tells them specifically to, to preach the gospel, but to teach everything that he taught, to do everything that he did. Well, one of the things that Jesus taught was that we are to pray for the sick. We are raised the dead, cleanse the leopards, drive out demons, freely as you have received, freely give. So we see in the early church, it was central, healing was central to the ministry of the early church. And James includes healing and confession and prayer and singing and all these things that were so central to the life of the church in his letter as he closes. He talks about the prayer of faith that will help the sick and save them and the Lord will raise them up. You see, God responds to faith. We are saved by faith on every level of our journey with God. God responds to faith, whether it's forgiveness of sins, whether it's restoration of relationships, whether it's healing of our body, our emotions, our mind, our memories, whether it's just prayer for our needs, our daily needs, God responds to faith, the prayer of faith. You see, James talked about faith in the very beginning. He talked about the fact if you were in, in a situation where you needed wisdom, you needed to ask God for wisdom. 
Because God loves to give you wisdom. He loves to give what you need. He responds to the prayers of his people. But he also says, James also says, he must believe and not doubt, because he who doubts is like the waves of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. You see, faith is the key. You ask in faith. Sometimes the only way you can get beyond your own unbelief and your own doubt is to confess it and repent of it in the Lord. To honestly tell the Lord that you're struggling with this and that you, you're sorry for this because unbelief and doubt is a sin. And God wants to set us free so that we can believe and we can receive what we pray for. We can experience healing and restoration in every area of our lives. So as we come and we ask others to pray for us, we do that in faith and we, we join our faith with their faith. And that's where the power comes to make things better, to bring healing and forgiveness. James says that when there are, there's sin involved, that you will be forgiven. You see, James knows that sin often blocks the grace of God, even as unbelief and doubt does. It can block answers to prayer. It can keep people in bondage. So you have to deal with the sin issue. Even though Christ has dealt with it on the cross and through his resurrection, you still have to deal with it personally and within your community. And this is the answer that James has. Not only that the sick get prayed for, but he has this remarkable statement. It's not just about the leaders praying for the sick. He says, therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. This is a community joining in together confessing those things that you know block you from receiving the grace of God in a greater way, confessing those things that are hindrances in your life. But not just confessing them, praying for each other. You see, that's, the, you know, a lot of people confess their faults and their hang-ups and hurts and habits and addictions. They do it at a bar. They do it over coffee. They do it over the phone. They go to a therapist. They do it over social media. They do it on TV and talk radio. They do it every place they get an opportunity. Sometimes they, they just ooze out their problems to any listening ear. And they know how to confess and to admit that they have a problem, but they don't do the next step. Confess to one another and pray for each other that you may be healed. You see, the key is not just being honest about your shortcomings. The key is not just confessing what your problems are or complaining about them. The key is doing it in a community that can pray, that has faith, they can pray for healing and restoration. In a community, that's what the church is called together, whether it's a small group in a program like Celebrate Recovery or whether it's one-on-one -on -one, or whether it's in a large setting in public worship. The key is not just the confession of your sins, but the praying for each other and praying for the healing process. You see, God wants to intervene. He wants to meet us at all these different levels. And, but we have to do our part. We have to be honest about what our struggles are. We have to be honest to be able to confess 
what our needs are, to ask for prayer, to ask for prayer for healing or, or prayer for situations in your life. And we do that in, in, in our church community regularly. But sometimes you have to do it in a, a setting where you are going to be free to really open up and share your needs and your brokenness in your life. Because that's where Jesus wants to heal us, in our deepest needs and brokenness. Because he forgives us of our sins. He cleanses us from unrighteousness. He will bring peace and restoration and healing. If we are willing to work through the process, if we are willing to be open and to seek the Lord through prayer and confession. We seek so many of the answers to our problems outside the church. Now, medical community, therapist, all these things God can use, but the key for the Christian is prayer. And the place that they should turn to is the Lord Jesus Christ and their brothers and sisters in Christ. So even when they use all these resources outside the church, it should be done prayerfully. It should be done also turning to the Lord and confessing faults to one to another and praying that you would be healed. It should be done in the community of the church where we sing and pray and rejoice together and where we minister in the name of Christ. You see, we have the name of Christ. We represent Jesus Christ here on earth. We are given the Holy Spirit. We have been given the authority as the disciples were given the authority to, to cast out demons, to pray for the sick, to heal the sick, to lay hands on them and they would be healed. We are given the authority to forgive sins, to pray for restoration, even restoration in communities and families, even restoration in nations. We are called to intercede, to pray for even unbelievers who are sick, who are hurting and broken and need an encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ. So that's what the church has. It's totally unique. There's no other institution on the face of the earth can do what the church does. And yet a lot of people are letting the church be swept aside as if it is obsolete, as if to somehow we don't need it anymore. We have all these other means, all these other resources. Why do we need the church? Because in the church is the power of the Lord, his presence, his word. You know, the church has the word of God. The word of God has is, is, is got healing in it. It's the power to change and transform individuals and to transform communities and, the, and, and even the world itself. The church has authority that no other organization in the earth has. Now Christians can go into the work field in the name of Christ because they have Christ within them and they can use that authority in the situation that they're in, whether it's they're a medical field or in social work or whatever they're in, they can have an impact on culture around them. And they should. That's what Jesus said, let your light shine. Don't hide it under a bushel, let it shine. Love the world around you. Tell them about Christ. But there's no substitution to the gathered church of Jesus Christ and what they can do when they really work with the Holy Spirit and allow his presence in the name of Christ to be exalted and, and, 
and teach and preach and live the Word of God. There's no, there's no other institution. You won't find healing and deliverance and salvation through sports or entertainment. You're not going to find it in science. You're not going to find it anywhere, not in politics. There's no other name under heaven which we might be saved except Jesus Christ. We represent him. And we have to begin to do that in a, a more conscious and intentional way to be used by him to bring healing, deliverance, and salvation to those around us, even those in the church itself as we confess our sins one to another and pray for one another that we might be healed. Amen. So we're going